Good morning. My name is Michelle Kazanja, and I'm the Director of Ministry at St. Thomas. And I'm here on this last Saturday morning in July today with um, my friend, Paul Jakowski, who is a longtime parishioner at St. Thomas. And this meeting is a little bittersweet because Paul is going to be moving up north. He's not going to be part of St. Thomas anymore. And I personally am really sorry to see Paul go. Uh, Paul has a wonderful solid faith in Jesus and is always positive and supportive. And he's been very active at our parish. So the new parish that gets him is going to be lucky, but we're going to take this last opportunity to talk to Paul about his history with our parish, what he's done here, and maybe how he'd like people to carry the flag going forward. So Paul, what would you like to talk about this morning? Well, th thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate uh, your kind words. Um, as you mentioned, I, my family and I have been parishioners at St. Thomas. It's at least a couple of decades easily, and it's it's been a wonderful experience, both um, you know person to person and spiritually. I mean, we we encountered many great people, and and most important thing is we've just grown closer to our Lord, to to our Lord Jesus, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So um, you know, we're very thankful that he's blessed us in that way. Um, yeah, I, you know, in the parish, um, when my son was little, I just started out doing things like RCIA, just, just, or not, I'm sorry, um, catechism. Mm -hmm. When he was little, just being kind of a, you know, a helper uh, with Miss Naomi, if you remember her, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And then got into RCIA for a number of years, and just finding ways to help. Um, joined the par uh, pastoral council some years ago as a member. Um, uh, then they elected me to to be the chair. Um, we worked to to we worked over the last two three years to sort of um, redefine or or use the divine renovation uh, framework. To, to help uh, bring our parish to um, you know a better place. Um, the pastoral council is, is all about um, you know uh, guiding our pastor, let's say in his in, in the parish team the in their decision making process but it's, it's more along the lines of you know helping to set the vision for the parish um, kind of the long term view as opposed to, um, you know, the, the more day-to-day -day operational things. So, um, you know, that's the pastoral council. It's, uh, it, it, it plays an important role. It's, it's there to, um, you know, at, first of all, we, just an example, a few years ago, we recrafted, let's say, the parish vision. And then from that flows a number of things that, really help really should help guide the day-to-day the -day operational things mm -hmm. you know because we all need to know the uh, it was called the game plan mm -hmm. so that um all the you know there's so many ministries at st thomas i think we counted like 60 ministries 60 different ministries and at one point you know they were you know everybody had had good intentions but we all weren't pulling in the same direction say you know some years ago so so we, we've been trying um, through this divine renovation um, approach to, you know, just uh, bring coherence and, um, and, um, and harmony to all the things we're doing within the parish so that we are all centered on Jesus and uh, what he wants our parish to do. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why it's important. The, the, the council will be going through kind of another renovation, I guess, if you will. Um, um, as Michelle mentioned, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm transitioning off the council. Um, but, um, you know, I've been working earlier this year to try and set uh, just, just kind of a groundwork or framework for what the new council, um, you know, could be in, in terms of how it, what it's, what it is to do. Um, you know, its methods, how it will function, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but the most important thing about the council is it's there to discern the will of the Holy Spirit and then, and then 
bring that uh, in a in a in a in, in concrete ways bring that to um, you know the mm -hmm. pastor and to the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I like Paul um, as you were speaking there are a couple of things I noticed about what you said that I appreciated one is that you use the word you know bring the plan to the parish team and I think that's something since I've been working at St. Thomas almost two years now that I personally have been really invested in is creating more of a sense of, of team between staff and parish council and leadership team and volunteers, you know, not, not breaking off into, well, we'll take our plan and we'll bring it to the staff or, you know, or we'll take our plan and we'll, we'll implement it. I mean, you talk about all rowing in the same direction. I think that kind of begs the question. A lot of people will be like, you know, you, you might encounter the, this this objection, which is, yeah, we're rowing in the same direction. We're all about Jesus. So what's the problem? <laughs> but I think, you know, if you look at the Acts of the Apostles, even the Apostles themselves had moments where they disagreed about what the will of the Holy Spirit was or which which direction they should take. So we can all about be about Jesus, but then we do need some concrete strategies, some things to come around in the parish that yeah, this is what we're going to focus on right now, or this is this is the way we're going to get from A to B. And I think that's a lot what the parish council and the pastoral plan is all about, right? This is what setting particular strategies or maybe prioritizing the goals that we're going to focus on right now. Is that is that accurate? Very much so, Michelle. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I don't know if, um, if you or any of our watchers have been... Um, following the, the series, The Chosen, but in that you, you get a, I think probably a, a realistic portrayal of how the apostles through uncertainty or just, or just, just who they were, their personalities, there was conflicts, there was, um, you know, debates and battles over what to do. I mean, that's, that's just, that's, the, you know, that's an aspect of the church that, uh, mm -hmm. You know, we just need to obviously be aware of, but then work through the power of the Holy Spirit to to overcome. You know, all our you know little personality, you know, foibles and and quibbles and all those things that can get in the way of really mm -hmm. pulling in the same direction. You know, and and acting as a team, as you said, to mm -hmm. yeah, that that's really important because we're all, you know, the, the Lord is, you know, Jesus is our is the head you know, of the, uh, and we're the body, right? Mm -hmm. So we all have to, you know, you know, find our place, know our place and, and act in harmony with our brothers and sisters. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I have seen since I've been at St. Thomas that I do appreciate is, you know, talk about the Lord being our head. Well, Father Bill is our, our head, but he, like Jesus, I think is very patient, very patient with everyone and their different ways of doing things. And also Father Bill is really, really supportive of those who want to be involved to kind of come onto the team and contribute. He's a good listener. He's respectful and he really values the efforts like of the pastoral council. I know he was very supportive of you guys making that pastoral plan, very open to what you have to say. And I know he's excited about reforming the pastoral council this fall. So maybe just to that point, a couple practical questions, how often, you know, you're, I know you did, you did and you are kind of crafting the, the overall structure or, you know, plan for the pastoral council. So how often would they meet, Paul? Well, um, over the last couple of years, we, you know, been uh, plugged into the uh, Divine Renovation Network, who's done, that, that organization has done wondrous things uh, to revitalize uh, parishes around the world, I guess it's fair to say now. And, um, you know, their, their suggestion or the benchmark, if you will, is, is probably a quarterly meeting of, of a number of hours each quarter. You know, it, it's got to be, a, um, you know, well-planned, well-thought-out, um, multi-hour meeting, you know, every three months, let's say. We were meeting monthly um, with various, you know, it was, it was mixed results um, in terms of what we were able to accomplish. But um, post divine renovation. Well, we're not really post yet, but you know, <laughs> these in the, in the <laughs> execution phase of divine renovation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we need to be um, 
our, our pastoral council needs to be very um, organized and focused. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's, it's, you know, one of the key things in our meetings would be time before our Eucharistic Lord. That, that should be, in my opinion, probably the, 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 the most important part of the meeting, just to start that meeting uh, in prayer, most definitely, but uh, most ideally to, you know, to start the meeting in front of our Lord and then let the meet, you know, let him guide the meeting, let his Holy Spirit um, mm -hmm. take us where we need to go. I mean, you plan the meeting ahead of time, of course, the agendas and that sort of thing, but uh, really let him guide our thoughts and our actions during that meeting. Hmm. That's great. I did not experience that aspect of it because I started well, coming to those meetings during COVID, right? So now that's good to know. We can start back with that again. Yeah, again, it's ideally you you do want, you, you prayer is, it's so essential, you know, to get, to properly dispose us to discernment and docility, you know what I mean? Because if we just roll in there with, you know, our agenda and just bam, 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 I mean, it's, it's a business meeting and that, that's arguably that's not what a pastoral council needs to be. It needs to be much more spiritual than maybe it has been in the past. I, I don't know. It's just, you know, my kind of point of view on that. That's great. Um, is there an ideal, an ideal number of people to have on a pastoral council, do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, yes, I, I, you know, you, you obviously want, uh, I've, I've heard maybe six to 12, somewhere in there is kind of the ideal range, you, too few, and it's not really, you're not getting a diversity of ideas, too many, and it's just, there's too many opinions, let's say, or too many, you know, and that, and again, no, no offense to anyone, it's just when you have too many um, cooks in the kitchen, if you will, yeah, it, you know, sometimes things don't get baked, mm -hmm. you know, on time or whatever, so. Um, was it yeah. important to you or was it something you were intentionally striving for or should we um, be trying to get a wide diversity of like types of people or background? I mean, St. Thomas is a little bit of everything, right? You know, so, so we, should we be looking to get, you know, a uh, representation from our parish of expressions of spirituality or political uh, ideology or, you know, is there something where are we trying to really mix it up or are you looking for more uniformity? No, I, th I, I think um, the pastoral council, sh the composition should reflect the composition of, of the, the parish, the congregation, you know, it should, yeah, it should be uh, diverse. Um, there should be, you know, diversity in, I guess, all senses of the word, right? It, uh, it needs to reflect um, our sort of, um, the way our parish represents the body of Christ, you know, it's, uh, because, you know, hopefully we all come in there with, you know, first and foremost in our hearts is, is, is the Lord, you know, and everything else, you know, whatever it may be, the, the, the more div the diversity part of it can be what it is, you know, that's fine. It's just, uh, you know, if we focus on the Lord, then, you know, we're obviously going to go in the right direction as a, as a parish. Okay. And do you have a sense for... Um maybe characteristics or, you know, qualities of a, a, a person who would be a, a kind of ideal member of the parish council? Like, should people have a certain age or experience level? Should they have, um, are you looking for a certain level of kind of theological training or background in the faith? Are you looking for per particular um, skills or like, you know, different maybe business skills or leadership skills or, or some sort of skill set that would be helpful to have? Well, that's a great question. I mean, ideally you want the, the council to bring its members to bring a whole variety of, of gifts and talents into the, you know, so that there's, we're not all the same, you know, we're not all, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? People with, different backgrounds, obviously different skill sets uh, that they can bring to bear on, on real problems we'll encounter. Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, just a diversity of life experiences um, that can, you know, just help us get, get, the, get a fuller um, 
understanding, you know, a, a fuller glimpse of the truth uh, in, in, in in those situations where we're seeking truth. Uh, that's that's very important. So yeah, the, the composition should be uh, mm -hmm. diverse. The skill set should be diverse, and in that way, um, you can get the best. Sometimes you can get the best uh, results that way. You know, obviously it depends on the Lord, but mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, I guess the 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 more loaves and fishes we bring, the maybe the more helpful that can be to the parish. Some loaves and fishes and some salad and some hummus and some, <laughs> some, some, sure. dessert and some wine. Um, could you maybe share about what might be a, a difficulty or something, a challenge about being in the pastoral council, maybe just so people have a realistic view of, you know, what they might need to look out for or, or be patient with. Um, so kind of, what was a what was a, a low point or a continual challenge for you or other members in being on the council? Well, yeah, in my in my experience, the um, sometimes it's just the the difference in personalities would lead to say not just differences of opinion, but there there would be polite conflict, mm -hmm. and you know which can be okay if I guess if you know a it's properly, you know, it's managed properly, that it doesn't become, you know, an all out trench war and be that it's um, the, the people involved, um, you know, are willing to consider other points of view, are willing to maybe eventually come around and, and you know, um, not just consider points of view, but maybe um, say, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to change my, mm -hmm. my, uh, my, my opinion, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try your approach, you know, just that it's kind of it's docility it's it's a willing to be flexible and to work together mm -hmm. you know kind of think of the the big picture rather than mm -hmm. you know just my little piece of it yeah so there you've mentioned kind of probably a really important characteristic of someone considering being on the, the pastoral council is to not necessarily come with an agenda you've used the word docility a few times docility to the holy spirit docility to other opinions um doesn't mean you can't have strongly held opinions but like you said have the flexibility to to listen and adjust as needed um so those are good things to bring out i think was the pastoral council is it made of just all parish members or was staff attending or is should it be both should it you know what what's your opinion on that well, uh, when, when I first started, I think we were all just um, elected, you know, there was no s staff, if I recall. Um, I think there was uh, Father Bill and the parochial vicar would, would be there, but that was, you know, in terms of staff. But um, later on, it was thought that it would be good to have staff there. But then <laughs> um, I think the Divine Renovation Network gave us some caveats about that because, you know, Staff members can, in a sense, be, um, I guess, subject to, you know, the pastor in a sense. So they may not be completely candid or forthcoming with ideas or opinions. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess there's a little bit of difference or, or debate over that. I, I'm not sure where it'll end up, but um, I think it can work well either way. It just, um, mm -hmm. it's... Um, it just depends, I guess, on who are member, the people who become members and, and how willing they are to work together. Okay. So maybe just, I know I've taken, <laughs> I said we'd be short, but I'm very interested in this topic. And I think you're doing a really great job, Paul, of explaining the pastoral council and kind of give, making it, I guess, more accessible and an idea to people who are listening to the interview. Um, so I'll just close this portion of our chat with one more question, which is in your time with the parish council, can you share about something that you think was an important achievement or is something you can look back on and say, yeah, I'm glad I was there and we, we did this, we accomplished this and I can, I can see the difference. I can see the change. Sure, Michelle. I, I think uh, without a doubt, it was the, let's say roughly two years we spent immersed in the divine renovation, um, uh, reworking of our parish vision, our mission, our all all the all the sort of things that that hopefully um, are being used to to guide and govern what uh, mm -hmm. 
what the comparisons were. It, it, it just, it, there was a lot of intense work the first 12 months of that period. And, uh, you know, um, there were some certain individuals who just uh, did, they just, you know, they care, they, they did a lot of heavy lifting for us and, and we're going to be very um, thankful uh, to them mm -hmm. um, going forward because um, with, without their efforts, it, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't have bared the fruit that it did. So yeah, very thankful for those people. I, I could mention them if you want, or I can just Yeah, say, go ahead. Why not honor them? For well, like, like Bernadine Simprich and, um, uh, Bill Kavnar, for example, um, uh, Deacon Jim Miles did, did a lot of uh, mm -hmm. things that were um, very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, there's just a couple names, but but everybody involved at one time or another was uh, was you know they were doing heavy lifting and mm -hmm. really helping to bring the project to uh, a point where it was a solid foundation had been set. And obviously it's, it's, it's a building project, like right. renovating a house, you know, you start low and build your way up, I guess, let's say using that metaphor, but yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, really, really thankful that those people uh, mm -hmm. did what they did. Yeah, I think it's a great tool. I know that since I've come on staff, you know, while I was on staff, the plan was still being developed. It came to the staff, maybe about a year ago, I think, where we kind of reviewed it and um, <clears throat> tweaked it, maybe added to it, gave input, and kind of came up with a final working document. But I will say it is a helpful tool, especially when hiring new people. I find like we're revisiting it from time to time to evaluate how we're doing and maybe adjust, but I find it real useful when you're bringing someone new on board because you have something to point to. You say, here's our vision, here's our mission, here are our, you know, areas of i guess divine renovation has various what do they call them like spheres of parish life you know fellowship and discipleship and spirituality all those things but you can point to those things when you bring on someone new and say here are the areas of parish life you kind of are responsible for this area you own this you know or you're helping to execute this here are the big goals that were set by our council here are some suggested strategies I mean, it just makes it easier when you come on board to not feel like you're you're coming in as an individual trying to create something from scratch and not really knowing where you fit in or exactly, you know, if these are just your goals or if they're, it, yeah, it's just a very great tool for communication. And like you said at the beginning, making sure we're all aligned and rowing in the same direction. So, so thanks for your work on that. That was a great gift to the parish. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's the year of the Bible. So before we close out, Paul, why don't you go ahead and let us know which scripture verse you brought today to share with those who are watching? Well, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I was thinking and praying about that. And what came to mind, this was some weeks ago, but it was the road to Emmaus. Okay. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want me to read the whole passage or well, how do we, you know, there's power in the word of God. <clears throat> Read the piece that you feel is, um, you know, the part you're going to reflect on. Um, yeah. And the whole thing, if it's the whole thing, read the whole thing. <laughs> it's okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful passage from the scripture. Um, I'll just, yeah, I'll just read this. I, um, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. So this is uh, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Now, that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. So this, this had occurred right after um, the passion and death of our Lord. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, you're the only visitor to Jerusalem that does not know of the things that have taken place in these days. And he, rep and he replied to them, 
What sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, our chief priests and rulers, both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They, have, they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. And some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the, as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As he approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, set the blessing, and broke it and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while well, he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they sent out at, set out at once and returned to J Jerusalem where they found gathered together the 11 and those with them who were, who were saying the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then these two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Such a beautiful story. And, and there's 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 just so much there. Um, I, I just made some quick points about it, if if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and just let me know if I'm going too long. But uh, so many things happening on so many levels. But but one of the things you can say right away is is Jesus always meets us where we are at in life. So here's these two downtrodden disciples. You know, probably just trying to get away and console themselves somehow. And, and the Lord, you know, just kind of, I would have said, he probably just kind of comes up alongside, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of like, um, uh, and, and then he, the Lord always waits for us to, for an invitation. So he's, mm -hmm. he's there for us. He meets us where we're at. He, you know, he wants to be invited in but he, he waits for that invitation. And then he begins to, um, you know, at first it seems like he's, he's there, he, he, he's there to teach and instruct. So he, he, he listens to where the, the disciples are, you know, he, I'm sure he senses where their hearts are at. And then he's maybe a little bit of tough love, but he says, look guys, um, <laughs> let, let's, let's talk about this. Let, let's, let's 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 take a deeper look at this because you you know they're maybe they're just stuck in their sorrow or their their dis, whatever it may be disillusionment disappointment whatever it was um he meets them there and he's gonna you know he's gonna lift them out of there but in a in just a, a wondrous spiritual way you know um and then you know um so he's talking, and like they said later, you know, their hearts were, were started burning. You know, the, the, just the, there was just something miraculous going on in this conversation. But again, they didn't know who this person was. So they're like, "Hey, come with us. Let's let's go, you know, let's go have dinner, talk some more." And then, you know, he he opens our eyes to his truth, his love, in that breaking of the bread. You know, mm -hmm. and. Um, and, and, and it, it's, it's, it points us to, to our, the wonder that the beauty, the mystery of the, the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at a, the, the Emmaus account, um, you almost see the Holy Mass represented there. You see kind of the liturgy of the word, you know, where they're walking and Jesus is telling them about the scriptures, right? And then you see, um, the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, where he gives us his body and blood. So you, you see both of those aspects of, um, 
the Holy Mass right in this uh, Emmaus uh, experience. And then, you know, um, after, after he shares his Eucharistic self with them, he, he disappears. Um, again, that, that, you know, there's, it kind of points to the, the mystery of, mm-hmm. of this, 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 um, this sacrament. It's just a wondrous mystery. And, and then finally, we're, um, when we encounter the Lord, uh, he wants us to share that with others. So, you know, he leaves those two disciples, and then immediately they want to go back and witness. You know, they don't just stay there, you know, and, and they, they, they want to go out to the world and witness that. So, mm-hmm. but just to me, it's just a, a, just a beautiful, um, a beautiful passage of a, a um, an encounter with the Lord on on, on many levels. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it just it just really it really resonates with me. So, Paul, you did a great job just breaking that open. I I hope you get lots of opportunities in your uh, new church, new environment to share scripture with people, or be involved in RCIA, or or share because you have a beautiful way of speaking about the Lord and the scripture. I wonder if there was a time in your life, you know, you talk about Jesus coming alongside of us where we're at. Was there, can you point to a time in your life where you felt like you were in that place of, of walking down the road, maybe feeling a little lost or confused and Jesus came alongside of you? I don't really know your story or your background. So just throwing it out there. Um, Yeah, most, most certainly. um, Yeah, there, there was, times earlier in my life when, you know, things were pretty rocky. Let's say, I won't go into all the specifics, but um, yeah, it was, it was pretty rocky. And, um, you know, it was really, um, maybe it was like I was kind of shipwrecked, you know, so I'm sort of kind of floating out there. I'm using a metaphor, obviously, but mm-hmm. kind of floating out there. And like the, um, the paraclete came alongside, you know, that, that mm-hmm. big ship that would help bring the smaller boats to safe harbor, mm. you know, and just kind of being shipwrecked and just being able to cling to that paraclete while I was, you know, I was still in troubled waters, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, I knew that, uh, through the grace of God that, you know, I, I would, he would bring me to a much better place. And he did. And he just, he just continues to bless us. I, I can't tell you this year has been, filled with blessings and it's it's been you know bittersweet to leave uh saint thomas and you know, but um you know the lord calls us on and, and we're all brothers and sisters in jesus and we're we all gather around that same um that same table every every week mm-hmm. and we all um you know share in the breaking of the bread so mm-hmm. we're, we're all together I want to thank you. That, thank that, you. that image of the ship, Paul. I never thought of that before. It's like the HMS Paraclete <laughs> kind of hooking up oh, yeah. to the boat. You know, the stormy seas of life. And <clears throat> sometimes you're out there in a rowboat. Sometimes you just got a, a life jacket on, if that, you know. And sometimes you don't have anything. Mm-hmm. You need, yeah, you need the, the, the help and grace of God. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming today to share and speak on Zoom. and. Um, God bless you up north near Traverse City, and I, I hope we see you back every now and then to visit for sure. Yeah, yeah we're going to be down this coming week. I don't know when we're going to be back in the same way, but I want to thank you, Michelle, for for your ministry and your witness, and uh, you're uh, you're doing great things for the parish. So God bless you as well, and, and we pray for you. Just uh, please continue continue that path you're walking with our Lord and. Just help, uh, you know, bring your loaves and fishes every day to the Lord to, you know, and he'll multiply them beyond uh, um, beyond our, our wildest dreams sometimes. Mm-hmm. So. Well, thank you, Paul.